Hi, welcome to a very special edition of the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle Pelisson, your co-host in the Head Witch in Charge at Holisticism. And I'm Wallace, your other co-host today. And I'm in charge of content at Holisticism. Welcome to the pod. This is a very special episode. Extremely. If you made it here, welcome. You are elite. And also thank you for being here, for listening, because they fetch are you guys. Yeah, we did a little Ask Me Anything. We polled you guys, asked some questions about what you wanted to hear for the pod for our 100th episode. So we're just going to hop into it because we have a lot of questions to get through and no point in dilly dallying. <laughs> so want to keep it sexy. Sexy, unique, short. So <laughs> Yes. <laughs> sus. This right. podcast is sus. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read off the questions okay. to start. Great. Our most requested topic and question is around how do you market your business without using IG or Facebook? Is that blogging, Pinterest, newsletter, in person? And people definitely also had the follow-up question of is blogging worth it? Are blogs dead? What's the deal? So what's your take? Lots of takes. My first question would be why do you want to market your business off of Instagram and Facebook? Just a question. Is it because you're like annoyed and can't figure out how to do it or it doesn't feel good or there's something else going on there? If so, it might mean that you just need to like renegotiate your relationship to these platforms because they can be really draining if you're not in the right mindset, I don't think. And I think we had like 150 people take digital alters, our notion for magical bodies class. And In that, we talk about reframing your relationship to Instagram and to your digital alters, these social media spaces that we create. And so many people said as soon as they changed their mindset around how they were using that digital platform, they instantly, like, Riv went viral. Like, every single day that the class was, yeah, Rivka Reyes made content that went viral every single day in that class, applying the lessons that we talked about. So sometimes that's it, right? Where we're like, Ugh, I don't want to use Facebook and Instagram. I'm going to use other methodologies because it's not working for me. And it's just a mindset thing. But if you're like, you know what, I'm fundamentally against Mark Zuckerberg. And I don't want to be 100% reliant on a platform that I don't own, like Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or something else, then yeah, it's nice to know how to market your business, especially if you have an offline business, something that's not digital or digitally native, perhaps like an in-person store, like a brick and mortar. So I would say there's so many ways to market your business. Making content and content marketing is a huge way to do that. And if you're not going to use Instagram and Facebook, dude, get thyself an email newsletter. When Instagram and Facebook went down and we had a blackout, I hope that you didn't hear me in your head, but I hope that you did hear me in your head in like a, oh man, I love Michelle. I'm so glad I listened to her. Not in like a, fuck Michelle, damn it. Why are you, stop rubbing it in my, stop rubbing salt in the wound. But Having an email list is so valuable because you can directly connect with your community without having an interloper or someone in between you, right? Someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Instagram or Facebook or an algorithm that doesn't work or an algorithm that's, I don't know, like cock blocking you basically from being able to say what you want to say, especially when it's important, like when you're trying to sell something to people or you have a deadline for when you need to reach people. So start building your email newsletter. Yeah. And we also have an amazing free course on email newsletters, email list magic, which I just sent to someone today reminding them that it was there because it's so valuable. It's also such a good way to get started and understand how newsletters and email lists work. So we'll link that in the show notes. 100%. And blog posts and blogging and YouTube, if you're not going to use Instagram and Facebook, yes, all of that is really valuable. No, blogs are not dead. Now, do people interact with blogs the same way that they used to? Certainly not, you know, when the height of Mormon mommy bloggers, I think, was on the internet. And we were talking a lot about white girl fall, white girl autumn. Blogging was huge. You know, you would link your outfits to your Amazon affiliate code and you could make or reward style and make millions of dollars, like literally just by posting your favorite outfits. The era of that type of blog is dead, but SEO, so search engine optimization using Google is still very much a thing and it's very alive. So I think that that's a really great thing to double click on for yourself if you want to blog. If you enjoy it, if you don't enjoy blogging, find another way that you enjoy making content. Maybe you love making videos. Maybe you love making a podcast. It's it's harder, I would say, to get people to a podcast because the discoverability factor just isn't there. There's not an algorithm or one central platform that people use like 
Google. There's a couple platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So the SEO isn't the same, but I still think that the best content you make is the content that you love making and you're going to call in the right people and you're much more likely to go viral or to resonate or to, to build an audience or community if you enjoy what you do. So if you enjoy mm-hmm. blogging, definitely do it. I think it's strategic with especially specific keywords that you want to rank for on SEO. And that can be a really powerful way to drive lots of traffic to your site when you're ranking on the first page of Google under a specific topic instead of using something like Facebook or Instagram to market your content out in the world. So that would be my answer. Also, like, don't sleep on, like, actual relationships and community and, like, asking people to refer you to their friends and creating opportunities for people to share your work. Make it easy for people to say yes to you. So when you apply that to your business, what does that mean? How can you make it easy for people to say yes to you? Perfect way to segue. (laughs) Moving on from the specifics of marketing your business. What do you feel like are some of the needle moving hurdles that every intuitive business will need to overcome to kind of make a frog leap? Or a quantum leap. Yes, that's. I like a frog leap. Frog leap. (laughs) It's big, but it's not quantum. (laughs) Yeah. Well, like a needle moving task is something that it deeply contributes to moving forward. So you can think of these things as the as something like a needle mover as being incredibly efficient and powerful. So you get the most bang for your buck. And I think that for a lot of business owners, it's time management and understanding. And well, like if we look at the archetypal journey of a bus- of an intuitive business owner or someone who's starting from a baby idea all the way to a thriving business, they start out with their energy all over the place. And then they bring their, they typically bring their energy in. So figuring out how to manage your time and how to invest your time thoughtfully in what you want to do. And that means understanding what you're moving towards, because a lot of the time where there are so many different things that we need to focus on when we're starting a business, we've got to get the website up and running. We've got to ideate our products. We've got to figure out who we're talking to. We've got to, I don't know, like get ourselves paid. We have to maybe hire people and figure out how to support them. And that's a lot. We got to figure out our branding. It's a lot of stuff. So my second thing next to time management that goes hand in hand with that would be prioritization. Figure out what's important to you. I love the book essentialism for learning more about prioritization and the book Atomic Habits. I think essentialism is like the philosophy and Atomic Habits is the practical application of the ideas of essentialism. And they're both awesome. I joke that James Clare is like a patron saint of holisticism for sure. We should make an altar for him, honestly. Yeah. But prioritization and figuring out what matters to you and, and you, not other people, not what your mentor tells you, not what your coach tells you, not what your parents tell you, but what matters to you and is important to you will make your life so much easier. I'm talking really fast because I want to try and get through these things as quickly as possible, but like, feel I, love free it. I love it. Let's keep going. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> like, this keep the energy up. That's great. I was just thinking about tyranny of choice when you said that. Yeah. It's a big issue. Yeah. That's what what keeps people stuck, right, is that they have so many options and so many choices. I mean, entrepreneurs out there or burgeoning entrepreneurs out there, how many times have you woken up at five o'clock in the morning, sat down at your computer on your couch with, you know, on your couch with your computer and your cup of coffee and been like, I don't even know where to start. (laughs) Like, I don't, should I go to the emails or should I go to the web? Where do I go? At least that was an experience that I had a lot when I first started holisticism. So prioritization, really helped me just start somewhere and start moving in one direction. And I swear to you, things will become clear. And if you make a mistake, it's okay. You can always reprioritize, you know, it's like dating. Exactly. (laughs) Just get started. The next thing would be money mindset. And like, I think that those buzz, that buzzword is like kind of ick, but just knowing your relationship, like be cognizant of your relationship to money. Are you good with money? Like, are you cool with it? Or do you want to make it? Are you like, tight, this looks good? Or do you need to work on your relationship to money? Because you're like, "Eh, I don't know. I still think people who make money are evil, but I want to start a business because guess what, buddy? If you have a business, that means you're making money. So if you want to have a successful, healthy business, then you need to change your relationship to money. That's just the long and short of it. If you don't want to deal with money, go start a nonprofit. That's fine. There's not, that's neither good nor bad. But if you want to have a business that is for profit then you are going to make money and or capital. So if you want to double click on that, we talk a lot about it in the North Node. We do. And also in 2022, we're going to be talking about it in another Notion for Magical Baddies class. I'm going to preview. Also on the podcast in November. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's coming. Crypto is coming. Also, I would say my final thing is in, as like a big needle mover is finding the distinction for yourself between overwork and burnout versus needing to be scrappy in the beginning. Because in the beginning, you do shit that you won't do in the future because like there's no one else to do it. And you also might push your boundaries a little bit and you might stay up a little bit too late and you might work a little later than you want to. And that's part of it. But you have to decide for yourself what is too much and what is necessary. What is worth maybe sort of a sacrifice. I'm not telling you that you have to hustle or that you have to like wear yourself down to the bone in order to have a successful business. But there are certain things that you need to do in the beginning that are not glamorous, that are not even really fun, that just that need to get done. And I think that a lot of people don't talk about that. And they glamorize it and they say, if you're in alignment, just like things fall to get like things fall in place and you only have to work four hours a day and blah, blah, blah. And that might be true for other people, but that has never been true in my experience, nor for any of these successful people that I know. So I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm just saying I've never seen it. And back to prioritization to make sure that you're doing it for you, not according to what other people say, because I think it's easier to burn out when it's not self-directed from a true place. It's a should or a have to from an outside force. Yeah. And and I also think that it's really healthy to set up sort of like deadlines and buy wins for yourself. When I first started holisticism, I gave myself two months to get profitable after I decided to not raise money anymore. And I'd kind of like been, I built the business plan towards getting investment from outside funders. And so I had to change my business plan. I said, okay, if I can't do this in two months, then I'm just going to like fold this thing and go back and get a regular job. And that was really helpful. That actually like soothed my anxiety. So it's like, all right, I have until this point to do this. And then I'm going to I'm going to move on and and figure out what comes next. But thankfully, we were able to get to profitability, which was cool. Well, speaking of paying yourself and becoming profitable, we had a lot of questions come in about the transition from side hustle to taking it big, securing crowdfunding and finding investors. So why don't we start with paying yourself and yes, how you start there? Do it. Pay yourself. Definitely read the book Profit First. And I wish someone had told me this when I first got started, but set your salary. What do you want to make? And I'm not talking about your, oh, I want to make $500,000 a year salary, although that's great. But what's your realistic salary that you can not just live on, but save money on and support yourself with and maybe support the people who are dependent on you with that you want to start with? And know that you're going to continue to Im increase your pay if your business does well, as your business does better year over year. And you can always move that salary up. But give yourself a, a salary that if someone else brought it to you, you'd be like, all right, yeah, I'll consider that. That's legitimate, not something that's just lovable because it's so low. When you work from the end, when you have the end in sight, it makes it a lot easier to set up the systems and also the boundaries for yourself for what needs to get done. And I wish someone had told me that earlier. It also generally means that you set up your books in a like more clean, sort of energetically organized way, energetically hygienic way. And I think that that's really important for intuitive business owners who might be afraid to do accounting and sort of like business and things and open their business bank account. Go do it. Go Go get a credit card. Go get a debit card. Make sure that you have a separate bank account for yourself and for your business because there is a, an energetic difference between funneling all money just towards your personal account versus putting it in your business's account. Also, there's like tax stuff. So just like keep it tight, you know? We also have a great class or many great classes on the in the North Node about this exact thing. Yes, we do. It's called Spellcasting CFO for all my North Noders out there mm -hmm. who want to go watch it. It's like a two-hour class, but it's good. Watch it at like 1.5 speed. It's really good. <laughs> That's a good tip. And Pilar's Money as Medicine is also really good. Mm -hmm. That's in there. Yeah. That An OG class. Awesome. Yes. Vintage, but still hits. So what about finding investors? So, okay. This was like kind of, I think it was, that was the question, like finding invest investors, question mark. And it depends. Like, I know that that's annoying. All of these questions depend on your business and what you want. So typically when we think of investment, we think of two types of businesses, a venture backable business and a lifestyle business. A venture backable business is a business that is expected to grow exponentially after getting an infusion of a lot of capitalization at the beginning of the business and it's supposed to grow super, super fast and not necessarily become profitable instantly. 
But because it's growing so quickly, it's inevitable or it should be inevitable that eventually it will reach a place where it's profitable and healthy. You can think of businesses that need a lot of infrastructure up front tend to be venture backable businesses and the the businesses that are going to scale to have millions of customers. So if you have that type of business, like a tech business or even a business where you're making hardware or you're, you're making something like a CPG product, a consumer packaged good product, then you might want to get money from investors like venture capitalists or even like a private equity firm can do investment. But if that's not you, then you probably have a lifestyle business. And as an investor told me once, you know, a 20 million, $20 million a year is a bad lifestyle because that's generally what a business that's a lifestyle business is. It's it's bringing in less than like $50 million a year. And I was like, you know what? You're right. That is a pretty sweet lifestyle. (laughs) And a lifestyle business tends to be less intensive at the beginning. Venture businesses also are generally shorter. So you'll have the business for maybe like 10 years and then you'll sell it. And the the eventual goal is to either IPO or to get the business acquired by somebody else to either go public or get a payout. So sell the business to somebody else. But lifestyle businesses grow slower. They grow a little bit more thoughtfully so that you don't see that hockey stick curve in the graph. And they don't require the infusion of capitalization up front in order to grow. They can grow like sort of slow and steady in a more organic way. And they can also continue on and on and on and on for as long as you want. So small businesses, family businesses, even big businesses that you know about, those are can be lifestyle businesses. And they also tend to be for a lifestyle, meaning you still get weekends off. You can go on vacation. You get to go home at five o'clock instead of working your ass off until nine o'clock at night and then waking up at six in the morning and going back into the office, which tends to happen when you're building a high growth startup. So um, in a venture backed space. So it depends on the type of investment that you want. If you're looking for an investment from VCs and start connecting with the people that you want to raise money from. Go look at the companies that are your competitors and who invested in them and at what stage, whether it's a seed stage, a series A, series B, so on, what stage they got investment from which investors. Go to their seed investors because you're just starting your business and look at the investors who are also in that category or who are comparable to them because they're going to want to invest in you. Your direct competitors, investors probably won't want to invest in you if you are truly a direct competitor. But if you have an adjacent business or sort of a shoulder business to another, I don't know, company in your industry, check out their investors. That's a great place to start. Build a spreadsheet, put about 300 inv- different investors on there and start reaching out to people. If you can get a warm intro, get a warm intro, meaning if you have a friend who can introduce you, do it. If you can't, cold intro, baby, write a really fucking good email and be persistent because that's how things happen. It's annoying. It's really annoying. And yes, the odds are stacked against people who are not white, hetero, cis men. But if you really want to do it, I believe in you. You'll do it. If you want investment for a lifestyle business, you can go to angel investors. You can go to small family offices. You can go to your bank. You know, your bank can give you a loan. So it really depends on the type of business that you want to build. And this is probably like a much longer podcast episode. But did I miss anything, Molly? No, I I think there's a lot of money out there to be found. It's just about finding the right people and matching the right investors. And there are a lot of funds for specific types of businesses and founders. So it is better than it used to be five years ago. Not saying it's easy, but there's a lot of opportunity. That's true. I'm glad you said that. It is there's definitely still opportunity. And I think people get short sighted and think that raising money is the only way to be successful. And I'm here to tell you that it absolutely isn't. And if you feel like you're compromising your morals, ethics and values too much to get money, then that doesn't go away. It's not something that you're like, it eats at you forever. And it only gets harder the more money you raise the more you give away of yourself and the thing that you've built. So if you are on the fence because you're worried about being able to sort of like maintain your ethics, then keep thinking about it. Don't, don't make any rash moves. All right. Next question. All right. So what about your side hustle being revenue positive and you're trying to figure out when is the time? How do you know when to really go all in? make it your main thing, take it bigger, send it home. Again, I think that's so personal. It really depends on you. And I also don't, I know that that it's like very popular to be like, go all in on your side business, like 
do it, quit your day job. And I think if you hate your day job and it's unhealthy, then you totally should. But if you like your job and it's you're still getting something from it, meaning it's paying you really well or you're learning there, stay. And it's not in like impeding your ability to do your work on the other business that you've built. Because number one, you're going to be your own investor and that's badass because you're investing the money you make there back into your own business. And you get to play and experiment on someone else's dime and you get to take what you want to learn and apply to your own business and have someone else pay for you to learn it, you know, at the company that you're working at. So I don't think that that's like, that's not going to be right for everybody, but that is right for a lot of people to just keep going. I think you generally know when, when in your heart, like when it's time to go, when it's time to leave. And for me, when it was time to stop consulting was when I was taking 80% of my time up with holisticism. And I just did not have enough hours in the day to also do other work. I just couldn't, like I was doing holisticism work while I was supposed to be on the clock for other people. And that was a good indicator for me of like, ooh, this is icky. I don't, I don't want to do this. And this is getting enough traction that it's time to like go and see what can happen. And I think also just make sure you're financially well resourced and whatever that means. I'm not saying you have to save $10,000. You know, I, I certainly didn't have that in my bank account, but do you have enough that you're not going to be so stressed about making this thing happen that it in, inhibits your ability to like show up and be present and maybe move slower when you need to and not move with a sense of urgency? Because when we move with sense of urgency, that's when we make a lot of mistakes and often when we, we stop listening to our intuition. So make sure that you can stay clear and just tap into your own highest self. That was a vague answer, but. Sorry, that's what I got. It's so contextual. Moving on to our last category. One of the questions that we had as an option in our community poll was about jealousy and comparison. So, and a specific question was, are the people that I'm jealous of expanders to show what I'm capable of or just distractions? I'll read actually the three questions. Okay. When friends are jealous and don't support you on your new success and new path, what do you do? And what do you do if you feel like you're constantly behind? Okay. First question, are they expanders or distractions? The term expander always makes me just roll my eyes out of my goddamn head. But for those not in the lingo, that's like a role model, right? Someone who is showing you a way. One might call it an archetype. So an archetype or a character that you want to embody, you know, I don't know. I think it really depends. Are you obsessed with them? Do you like stalk them on the internet? Do you judge their every move? That seems unhealthy. You might want to just like backtrack from that. Anything that's not keeping you in your own lane, like probably good to just put them on mute, maybe unfollow them and go on with your life. I think that like keeping your head down and moving in silence is one of the coolest things that you can do. And it's, I aspire to be the type of person who moves in silence and just surprises people with, with the epic shit that they're doing. <laughs> so that's my personal take on it. You know, jealousy also isn't just shadow work. It doesn't mean one thing if you're jealous or envious of somebody. You know, sometimes we're jealous because we feel like there's an injustice in the world that we're seeing, that someone who doesn't deserve the things that they're getting, maybe because we don't perceive them to be the type of person who should deserve those things. And maybe that is true, a true injustice that's happening in the world. Maybe it's a mindset thing that you need to work on yourself and you're sort of projecting some stuff onto them. But I would say in general, like, I don't know, I, I wouldn't look to anyone in total, like any one person I, if, as an example for who to be. I would say it's much healthier to, from my perspective, to look at different elements or traits or ways that people show up throughout their lives and sort of pull from one or two of those places. Like, you know, my mentor, Ivy, I don't want to replicate her entire life. In fact, there are lots of things about her life that I don't want, but there are many things that she does that I'm like, wow, that is so cool. And I'm not going to write her off completely as a role model just because she has created a life around her that I don't necessarily want for myself in the future. I, I think that that's a lot more powerful and also a lot more interesting. And that's how you still like an artist. You don't just try to copy someone's life a la like swim fan or something or like, you know, <laughs> angry goes west. Yeah, exactly. You, you want to like pull inspiration from different elements and lots of different people. And that's how you become the most you to you. 
Yeah, I could be wrong where this question is coming from, but often when we're feeling that way about someone, it's because we're putting them on a pedestal. Usually on the internet, we only see one very one-dimensional aspect of their life. And even if we don't know people that well, and we put them on a pedestal and idolize them and imagine their life is a certain way, but that's a slippery slope too. We are all complex, nuanced beings. Yeah. And the internet is not a mirror image of the real world. It's not even, it's not even a mirror. It's its own place. Yeah. It's its own place. Don't forget it. (laughs) Okay. What about when your friends are jealous and they don't support you? Not supporting me. (laughs) I mean, that's, that's a them issue. Yeah. I I think. I agree. Also, your friends aren't your fans. I think that's something to remember. Friends and family aren't your fans. So when you do something that changes how they perceive you or changes the bucket that they put you in normally and that makes them uncomfortable, they might not want to support you because that is forcing them to grow and evolve in a way that they're not ready to. So I think it's important to remember friends and family are not fans. They might not be the people to support you, but that doesn't that's not necessarily a bad thing. But also that could be a them issue. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with you. Yeah, either way, don't take it personally. And, you know, this is like part of of building something and and being more yourself is if you have people in your orbit or in your vibration who who aren't fully themselves, who like still are finding their way, it can be really hard for them. And like as you grow and evolve in your life, you're going to be in sync and out of sync with lots of your friends. And that doesn't mean that they can't be your friends anymore. It just means that you're yeah. going to have to find other paths of convergence. And so, you know, I have a lot of friends who I used, who I met when I started holisticism. We used to only talk about business and now we don't because we have very, very different businesses. And I don't think we would be able to maintain our friendships if I talked about what we do at holisticism. So, if you really like love them and value them as a person, like find out what else you have in common it can be a good mm-hmm. test. I think. No, I, that's such good advice. And also focusing on the positive aspects of the relationship. Like if that's the person that you can go on a hike with and that's your hike buddy or the person that you can talk about horror films and true crime with, just focus on that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And everything changes. You might be on, on top right now, but Things can change overnight and you never know. You, you just never know. Life is long. So don't just cut people out just because they're in a moment. Like I think compassion is really important and healthy boundaries, but compassion. Okay. What about when you're feeling like you're constantly behind and you, everyone else is, you're in the flip side of this, right? When everyone else is like kicking ass, it looks like, and you feel like you're not kicking ass. What do you do? Are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> not, not asking you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's a slippery slope comparison because it sounds so corny, but you really are on your own journey. And once you start comparing, I mean, that's a endless spiral of comparison, I think. And to your point about being heads down, staying in your lane, I don't think is overrated. Winning your own race is not overrated. It's really just you and you trying to be your own best in whatever scenario that is. And and the minute you start to compare to somebody else, I, it can be so discouraging. And there's always going to be someone with X more, or you always perceive somebody with, you know, they have X more money, they have X more friends, they have X more business opportunities, whatever it is. And I think the more that you focus on that, it kind of expands versus focusing on your lane and what you're working on and your own race. I don't know. It's corny, but I feel like it's really true. It is. I feel every year as I get older, I'm like, yeah, that's comparison silly. And also life is so long. The people that you are comparing yourself to when you're 21 or 23 or 25, like usually <laughs> as you get older you, you and you really take stock, you're like, oh my God, we want totally different things in our lives. <laughs> like, no, I, I absolutely do not want to get married and move to the suburbs at 27. Although that was definitely on my life plan when I was 18 years old. I'm so happy I didn't do that. And no shade against anyone who that's their dream. That just, you know, is not my priority anymore. And I think that that's helpful too. When you feel like you're behind, remembering like, what is your priority? What What is valuable to you? What is happiness to you? What are you sort of orient, orienting yourself towards? Because it's probably really different than 
the person that you're jealous of or there's some difference and it's less about the material things that surround you know that surround us and it's more about like okay what is the spiritual or emotional level we want to be on and how can we or what are, what are we orienting ourselves to i'll say it i'll say it again and how can we begin to take action towards that instead of just like acquiring more stuff you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well said i agree thanks you're not behind you're perfectly on time like you're exactly where you need to be you're perfectly on time and even when it doesn't feel like it even when you feel like you're just a total piece of shit and like everyone has it together you're exactly where you need to be you really are Mm -hmm. yeah I think it's really redefining what success is in your life and whether that's your definition or if that's society or if it's somebody else's idea of it that you've tried on because we all do it and sometimes I think it's hard to parse through that and realize what model of success you're following and I think I've just gotten through certain scenarios or gotten things that I've wanted where I was like oh I actually don't want this why did I think that I wanted it you know those traps of being human (laughs) yeah I feel like it happens a lot with like love and and money and business and stuff where you feel like you're behind everyone else you're not you're not whatever able to to toe the line I remember when I first started holisticism I had a friend getting married and she had this really expensive bachelorette party in Nashville and I don't think she listens to the podcast so it's fine that I can say it and I just couldn't afford to go I I just I I couldn't afford to like take that many days off. I I didn't want to drink because I knew that if I drank, then I wouldn't be able to like go home and do work or stay as focused as I needed to be. And I just didn't have like, it ended up being like two grand. It was really expensive. I just didn't have that money to do that. And I felt like, oh my God, I'm almost 30. How is this possible? I thought that I was going to, by this time in my life, I would be rolling in it. I'd be comfortable. I'd be able to do all the things that I love to do and, and show up for the people that I love. And now, a couple of years later, I'm like, oh my gosh, number one, I still probably wouldn't go because that sounds like a fucking nightmare to me. But that would be a no brainer. It would be so easy for me to make that decision to spend that money on someone that I loved or something that I cared about. I wouldn't have to take a second thought to do it. But I felt so behind then. And I feel so far ahead now compared to my my same friend group, just but in a different way. I don't even feel like we're playing the same game or we're on paths going in the same direction. So it doesn't even feel like I'm ahead. I feel like I just see like, oh, we're totally different. There's absolutely no opportunity to compare. It's like apples to oranges. And I remember in that moment, like crying and being so embarrassed about that stuff. And to look back on it now, it's like, well, I just want to hug little Michelle, little old Michelle. What would you say to someone who's feeling those things right now? I think often when we have moments like that, those are some of the biggest catalysts to get us into action. I had another moment with Ethan a couple years ago where I thought, if this guy gets really sick again, how can like I support, and we're talking about spending the rest of our lives together, like how can I support us? Like what what are we going to do? And it really lit a fire under me to like figure my shit out and make a business that supported me and supported other people and didn't burn me out. And I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have had that sort of like clear intention if I didn't have that sort of threshold moment. So I think, yeah, sometimes they're like a call to the light, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like the idea of reframing anxiety as energy sometimes to get you into action Mm -hmm. or excitement, excitement, breathless excitement. Exactly. Exactly. Another thing, final thing that my dad always says is losers keep score. That's what Mm -hmm. he says. I mean, I don't really love like putting people in as winners and losers, but I think about it a lot when I like, (laughs) when I like get sort of like lost in the sauce about numbers where I'm like comparing my numbers with somebody else's business numbers. And I'm like, you know what? Losers keep score. And so that helps me. Well, it's a distraction. I think those are the, yeah. Yeah. It's not the only metric of success. In fact, it's Mm -hmm. like rarely the metric of success. Mm -hmm. Yep. This was so much fun to see what you guys are thinking about and noodling on. And coming up is our second launch of our Notion for Magical Baddie System Spells course. We changed the name. (laughs) But I'm just looking at all of these questions and there's so much in the System Spells course that is really helpful for answering these questions because so much of it has to do with 
staying in your lane, prioritizing time management, creating systems that work well for you so you don't need to overwork. I was thinking back on when I was sitting, when I said like, oh, I would sit at my I, stupid like Ikea couch at five o'clock in the morning with my computer on my lap and be like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? And I was living in a studio apartment in Koreatown. And that was the time that I discovered Notion. That was around the time in my life that I discovered Notion. A friend told me to check it out who was also building a startup. And truly, that's when that was when my life changed and when I started organizing and being able to prioritize and really put my head down and do my work and move in a direction and make a quantum leap. And like my first notion setup was so janky. It was not as advanced and cool as it is now. It was just like four and a half years ago. But that system helped my sort of squiggly, my very squiggly ADHD intuitive creative brain just like laser focus and move my energy in one direction as opposed to letting my energy sort of like escape in infinite directions outside of me, which would keep me stuck. So that's important to understand. And if you're feeling like you're in this moment where you're like, ugh, I'm just leaking energy and I don't know where to go next. I think that system spells would be really useful, not only just understanding from like a high level perspective how systems work, but also actual practical application inside of Notion. And it's really fun. Really, really fun. Really fun class. And it's uh, live. You'll get all the recordings, but we do all of the work live because I don't know about you, but I need accountability. So I'm going to be doing it along with everybody again. And it's just so fun. You get to meet other really smart, super cool, intuitive people who are creating their own systems. You also get access to an amazing library of dashboards. Oh, my God. The library is so good. It's so good. There's so many different types of dashboards in there, too. Like there's astrology, plant care, money, whatever topic you want. Essentially, there's a template that someone has made that is cooler than any template you could have made and then inspires you to make your dashboard on Notion even better. Yeah, that's part of our your homework when you take the class is that you create a dashboard and then we pay you if you turn in your homework on time. Like we literally send you $100 if you do your homework. It's the best school ever. And you get lifetime access to this library of amazing templates that people have created. So I think there's close to 70 templates in there now. That was after our beta cohort. And I expect we'll have just as many getting added to this session. And it'll continue to grow as as more and more people take Notion for Magical Body System Spells. So you get in early, you get all, all of the templates. So it's going to be fun. If you have any questions, shoot us DMs. Shoot us every DM or email or just let us know what you're thinking and where you're stuck. And the deadline to sign up is Monday, uh, October 25th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. If you have ADHD or you're a squiggly brain person, you're probably a procrastinator. And I'm just going to say it to you out loud. I expect that people are going to procrastinate and wait till the last minute. Unfortunately, we have to close the doors at 5 p.m. because this is a live class. And our team has to do things on the back end to set up everyone's first success. So I have to be kind of a bitch baby and, and not let people in after 5 p.m. So so if you want to take class, make sure that you set an alarm and you sign up. Either sign up right now or set an alarm so you can sign up before 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time on Monday the 25th. And we'd love to see you in there. I hope to see you guys there. It's going to be so much fun. Really and let's get into the grab bag questions. A real quick fire Q&A. You ready? All right. I'll read the first question and then you got to answer. Oh, sure. Okay, you ready? Let's go. How do you get started on a big project? ADHD brain over here. You know, it's fun to use an analogy. Do it. I'm Metaphor. Ready not to go analogy. Right Metaphor. Sure. Take your favorite hero's journey, archetypal journey. Mm -hmm. I will use the example of the Wizard of Oz. Okay. You know, when Dorothy lands, <laughs> when she gets there at the beginning of her journey, she's like, I don't know where to go. I'm just going to put one foot in front of the other. Take a few steps along the yellow brick road. <laughs> you know, it's cliche, but it's true. At least for me, there isn't anything fancy. Mm-hmm. One thing that helps me is write out where I am now, mm -hmm. the goal of where we want to go, the steps in between, but short term, just what I have to do that day. Brilliant. How about you? How do I get started on a big project? First, I decide if it's actually a project mm. or if it's a multiple projects. So that's how I start. Then I decide how much energy do I have to devote to this thing and is that sufficient for what I want? So... If, like, for example, I really want to redecorate our house, like redesign our house, and I'm not going to do the whole thing at once because I would fail. 
I have to start with one room at a time. And I'm like, do I have the space to do one room at a time? Which room should I start with? Okay, the living room. That makes sense. Maybe the corner. Maybe the, just the corner, exactly. Not the bedroom. And then I'm like, all right, what's my budget? What do I have to work with? Well, how long does, is this reasonably going to take me? And then I just start to chip away. Again, kind of one step at a time. But I like to do an assessment of like, where the fuck am I? Mm-hmm. And what needs to happen? And it, can I do this? to the level that I want to do it because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. If I can't do something to, like, my you standard. Timer, didn't you? I did. <laughs> if I can't do something to my standard, I don't want to do it at all, which is something I'm working on in therapy. Mm. But that's Good it. answer. Thank you. Here's the next question, Wallace. What are your best practices for collaborating on a workshop with a fellow witch or collaborating in general? Decide on your rules of engagement for yourself. Ooh, like, what great. are you, yeah, like, right, basically, like, your contract rules. You don't have to do that, like, out loud or say it to them. But, like, what are you willing to work with and what is, like, the boundary for you? Like, what are you not willing to deal with anymore? And articulating super clearly what you need in order to do your best work. So I don't like it when I get multiple emails. I don't like working on an urgent timeline. I don't like it when I don't get paid for things. So I articulate that. When I start working with someone, here is what I need in order to do my job well and say it really clearly so that they can meet my needs or they can tell me I actually can't meet your needs. And then I ask them what they need because a lot of people don't know what they want or need in a partnership. And I would say that's also just like if you ever get sponsored by anything, ask what the rules are. What are people measuring and what will success look like for your partner? Because if they don't know, then they're going to say at the end of your partnership, that it wasn't successful. A hundred percent. That's great advice. Okay. Excellent. Next one. How do you trust yourself? I take my time to make decisions and I try and check in with myself and I try and check in with my body in a very simple way of, does this feel expansive or restrictive? Am I getting a stomach ache immediately? Or am, do I, I get very visual about it. I imagine you know, a fork in the road and going between two different paths. And usually you'll get a feeling for which path feels more expansive and which path feels more restrictive. Mm -hmm. So that's also a little bit vague, but that's kind of how we work with it. And I'll go based on how I'm feeling in the moment. And maybe that's right in the moment, but maybe it turns out to be a huge learning experience. (laughs) But then I trust that that was meant to happen because I need to learn that thing. What I'm hearing is... You trust yourself in the moment, you gut check mm. with what's true, mm-hmm. and then you reassess as needed, yeah. which is like kind of, I think, all you can do to develop self-trust mm-hmm. is like kind of constantly reassess and be like, okay, I still believe in that thing. Is that still the right path? Is this still feeling good? Mm-hmm. And when it's not, then you adjust. And I don't know, like I've made a lot of mistakes that where I haven't trusted myself, and usually it came down to me ignoring Mm-hmm. and not reassessing mm-hmm. and being like, it's fine. It'll get better. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. Stop. You're being crazy. Mm-hmm. And eventually I got so far off the path of my own intuition and my own self-trust and what I, where I wanted to go that I was like completely lost in the woods. And I think if you can reassess regularly, look at your GPS regularly or your map regularly and be like, right, am I still going in the right direction? Then that prevents, you know, getting lost in the forest. Yeah, because I also think I'm very susceptible to saying yes in the moment and being excited about anything because yeah. of other people's energy. I'm just like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Ask me anything. I'll say yes. I'm in. <laughs> and then you walk away and you're like, oh, <laughs> why'd I do that? Wait, what's your authority in human design again? Are you emotional? Sacral. Ah, oh, sacral. Mm-hmm. So you're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Yeah. And that's kind of, I can't really do it in the moment it's very hard for me to say let me get back to you but i try and force myself to do that that's good mm-hmm. yeah i'm asleep on it i'm an emotional so mm-hmm. i like to sleep on things mm-hmm. all right next question what is your skin like oily combo dry i don't know this question came out of left field but i like it oh what what a variety of questions we've got going on <laughs> i'm combo i'm i'm going through a skin crisis so i don't want to talk about it <laughs> Your skin looks great. It does. It does. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It doesn't feel great. Maybe that's the thing. I think mm. the most important thing is that it feels good. I care what my skin looks like. I'm not going to pretend I don't. Yeah. But the biggest thing is that it feels good. Right now it feels dry and irritated. Mm. I was actually thinking about this yesterday. It's like, oh, man, having pimples sucked. It's. Mm. I had acne for so much of like 20 years of my life and 
just like, oh, you know, that I don't see it on anyone else. I don't notice it ever on another person. Mm -hmm. But like when you have something on your face, it just feel when you don't feel comfortable in your own skin, it like really is distracting. Mm -hmm. I I still have it. Maybe once you hit, I mean, now I'm almost 33 and I'm finally growing out of face acne, but back knees still kicking. It just like moves around your body. (laughs) Rotating. I love this question because what is your skin like? I've got dry skin. For your listeners? Oh. You have dry skin? Yeah. I have dry skin. Not, not yeah, you do. You're like, yeah, flaky. <laughs> flaky as fuck. You're, you actually look so moist right now. Like, your skin always looks hydrated. Thank you. Thanks. It always looks very fresh. Thanks. That's because I wear a lot of moisturizers and uh, heavy acid. No, actually, hyalur- hyaluronic acid makes me more dry. Uh, I don't know why. I try all the things with it. I've tried all, followed all the instructions. It just doesn't work for my skin. Neither does vitamin C. Vitamin C just doesn't work for my skin. My skin doesn't like it either. Yeah. So I've got dry skin and I love to moisturize and I love a I love a creme. Mm. Love a cream. Love something heavy. I also love like putting Vaseline on my face. Oh. I love Tyra Banks. Yeah. All over? Mm-hmm. Seal it in. It's called slugging. Oh. Yeah. I like it. Everyday old slug? Yeah. No, not every day, but I do it every once in a while. Yeah, every once in a while. It doesn't like actually moisturize your skin because it creates a barrier where like Mm -hmm. it's whatever science, but like basically your skin can't breathe. So it's not, I don't think it's good if you have like acne probably because it would lock in bacteria, but I wash my face at night. I'll put in like, put on a serum or something and then sometimes I'll I'll slug. Slug it in for the eve. Let it, let it brew. And then I take it off in the morning. Yeah. Hey, Ethan. Ready to slug it. He hates it. (laughs) like no <laughs> not the mess like do you want me to be beautiful <laughs> you know how hard i work with it. seriously you're so cool i have to be beautiful <laughs> so you're gonna leave me <laughs> you wouldn't hey bye i know <laughs> i don't want to risk it just kidding that was a joke let's get to the next question any anxiety slash adhd resources that you found helpful my anxiety is through the roof lately i feel you dear listener <laughs> yeah. word I had a particularly tough morning before coming to the studio. You know, you know. Feeling great. Yeah. That mood just really picked you up. And I think this enclosed room where we can't really do anything else because we only have three hours forces us to be very. Yeah, I was actually thinking about it. I was like, I'm kind of excited to sit in the padded room. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That feels very safe. (laughs) Well, like. Yeah, I know. (laughs) And. I would say resources have been learning about ADHD and also sleep and exercise. Big for me. I don't get enough sleep. My days, it's very hard to focus and not feel anxious if I don't get enough exercise. Same thing. Hey, man. Those are good answers. But it's not sexy, you know? I know, right? The basics. I know. It's It really is like reading. Yeah. <laughs> Just go home and go to therapy. <laughs> go read. Yeah. Yeah. I think like... Honestly, going to therapy obviously is very helpful if you have ADHD. I think talking to other people about their experiences. I don't want to like recommend TikTok or the internet necessarily as places to like learn more about ADHD because there's a lot of misinformation, but it can be very like empowering to see other people who maybe struggle with the same things that you struggle with that you didn't realize were not normal or like you didn't realize maybe even other people had it, you know, like it's hard for other people to return things to like to bring things to the post office so they just never do it like maybe you thought that you're just a lazy piece of shit you're not it's nice to feel seen it really is i also think that knowing how your brain chemistry works as someone with adhd is really really helpful Mm -hmm. and knowing about dopamine and norepinephrine Mm -hmm. and how a combination of fear and novelty are what get us into action because that's what dopamine is. Dopamine is like we get that from novelty and newness and things that are interesting, shiny things. And also we need fear and a little bit of anxiety to get us into motion. And I think like under, just understanding that concept is really helpful. Yeah, it allows you to have some distance to kind of see yourself from bird's eye perspective. And be like, oh, that's what I need right now. Yes, that's what I want. Exactly. Or like I'm adding to cart incessantly. Yes. Yes. Or like, oh, this is why I keep putting this writing this thing off until an hour before it's due. Mm -hmm. It's because like I'm trying to get myself into action. It's not because I don't like it or I don't want to do it. 
another reason. So I think that that's really helpful. That's where I'd start. Yeah, that's it. And those are all our questions. Thank you for sending them in. This is the 100th episode, right? Yes. So, wow, we made it. Look at us. We did it. We did it, Joe. Look at us now in a studio. We started from such humble beginnings. Literally started in the middle of the pandemic. Having never met each other. Having never met each other in person. And I was like, hey, you're now in charge of a podcast. You want to make it? Good luck. <laughs> Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I'm going to cry, but okay. <laughs> Down for the cause. You did great. Look at you. Thanks, lady star. So, yeah, we made it to our 100th podcast and episode. And that's because you listen to us. So thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for being here. This has been real fun. We're flattered. Damn. We are honored, honestly, that you want to hang out with us. And that you just make make the time that you let us know you like the podcast, that you write into us, that you, I don't know, tell us that it's changed your life. Like, that's really, really cool. Even when you're like, didn't change my life, but I did laugh. That's still rewarding. Yeah. You know, it's very rewarding for us. And we want to always encourage you, let us know what you think. Yeah, say how you feel. Yeah. Tell us what you want more of. Yeah, yeah, we love that. Thank you so much for tuning into the 12th House Podcast. We love you. We appreciate you. We're stoked that you're here. And we couldn't do it without you. We really couldn't. We love you so much. Also, we really appreciate it when you share the podcast with your friends. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye.